Shri Guru Bhyonamaha. I bow at the lotus feet of my Guru Paramhansa Yogananda. And I bow to his great lineage of Gurus, Mahatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, and Swami Shri Yukteswar Giri. And I bow to my divine friend and guide, Swami Kriyananda. Friends, uh, welcome to the 12th episode of the series on the Mahabharata. As we have been seeing in the last few episodes in the story thus far, um, we are actually seeing the gradual unfoldment of the spiritual virtues represented by the Pandava brothers. You know, starting with the training under Drona, uh, the training in disciplines through the 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 discipline of habit that's the first phase of their life and after that because of the cunning plans of Duryodhana they're vanquished into the forests and they go through a period of extreme austerity taking with them all this training that they've already gained and when they come back uh, they gain the hands of Draupadi essentially the chakras uniting with the Kundalini and the Kundalini power that is now flowing in their spine through that austerity and uh, deep concentration and uh, they also have the support of King Drupada, but not only that, uh, they also come to contact with Krishna. Krishna, who represents Guru Consciousness. Now that we are spiritually receptive, the Guru appears to guide us forward, to support us every step along the way. So now uh, the Pandava brothers have Krishna by their side. And when they come back to the palace of Astinapura, they realize it's impossible to coexist with the Karava brothers because the material side uh, is still the same and the spiritual side is matured enough that they cannot necessarily stay in the same quarters. So the kingdom is split and they take uh, the less appealing part of the kingdom, uh, which is Prastha and they make it Indra Prastha through their own uh, tireless efforts and the support and the grace of God and Guru. They turn that land into this extremely prosperous kingdom and Yudhishthira becomes the emperor. But all this while, as we see, not only the Pandavas, but also Bhishma and uh, everybody in the palace of Astinapura, I mean all the virtuous ones like Drona, Bhishma and all the others, uh, I'm not referring to the Karva brothers, there is this belief uh, that somehow the Pandavas and the Kauravas can coexist, that the two opposing poles of the consciousness can somehow strike a balance and they can live together uh, without needing to destroy each other. Uh, and everybody holds on to this belief so tightly uh, that until the very moment of the war, uh, nobody is able to accept this reality as the most inevitable, despite the fact that Vyasa throughout this whole time has been telling everybody that war is inevitable, that nothing can stop the war and all of this is only heading there. This is allegorical to exactly how our spiritual life works too because we hold on to all the things that are near and dear to us and we are also attracted to the light, uh, to the spiritual side of things and inspired by that deep inner life and we are pursuing both and we hold on to this belief very strongly that both of that can coexist. Yes, they can for a certain period in time, but eventually, eventually, in, in, uh, in, in the spiritual journey that we are all on, as, as we keep attuning ourselves uh, to the divine consciousness, to God and to Guru in the form of uh, that God consciousness that has come incarnate to help us, uh, it is uh, unavoidable that we have to let go of even the tiniest of desires. Uh, even the smallest things that hold us to this material plane have to be let go. And there is no peace possible between the negative and the positive poles of the consciousness. The only inevitable end is the positive side will expand and expand and expand eventually until one day we can become one with God. And that is the eventual destiny of every soul, uh, not just of the Pandava brothers or of the great ones or the saints but of each one of us, and that is the story of the Mahabharata. So, uh, where we are right now, however, is a stage where everybody is trying to coexist peacefully, uh, especially the Pandava brothers, because they certainly don't want to cause any chaos. They are happy for Duryodhana to have the palace of Astinapura and to rule that kingdom. Uh, they are happy for Dhritarashtra. They still uh, have good connections with Bhishma, Drona, and everyone else. So they have they think that they have achieved this perfect balance that they can hold on to. But things are going to shift very soon because, as we all know, the plans are brewing in the palace of Hastinapura and Duryodhana and Shakuni are not going to be able to uh, stay peacefully knowing uh, that the Pandavas have such a fertile and prosperous and wealthy kingdom right next to them. Now they want um, that as well. So Shakuni comes up with a plan 
Shakuni says, let's invite Yudhishthira and the Pandava brothers to a game of dice uh, where they bet and they play uh, this kind of a board game, <laughs> basically. Uh, and uh, they can start betting things and he can eventually win over everything that they own. Uh, now, this plan is pre presented to Dhritarashtra, not necessarily as a, a scheme to take over Pandava's kingdom, but as a way to invite the Pandavas and to host them here in Hastinapura. Now, the game of uh, dice has a very bad rep uh, in the culture and the tradition, but also in general, in terms of the vibration that it represents. So, Dhritarashtra is first hesitant, but then, as Duryodhana is always able to, he sways and convinces him. And Dhritarashtra now asks Vidura, as his prime minister, to go to the Pandavas and invite them to this game of dice. And Vidura takes this message to Yudhishthira, and uh, Yudhishthira is first hesitant, because he knows uh, that according to the Shastras, according to the scriptures, um, playing the game of dice is not a good thing. The game of dice itself has a low vibration. I don't just mean board games have a low vibration, but that attitude of betting on things, that whole game of gambling, we are talking necessarily about gambling. And we have to understand the subtlety here, both in a literal sense, in the allegorical and the metaphysical sense. The game of gambling itself is that part of the consciousness that immediately pushes us into calculating self-advantage, into getting things for ourselves. So it does have that negative vibration. So in the Indian tradition, it is considered a, a very low thing to do. It is not considered a thing that uh, people that are dignified or noble would do at all, uh, even though on the face of it, uh, it does not seem all that harmful, uh, the consciousness that it represents is pretty low. That's why people stay away from gambling. Um, I mean, in a traditional sense, I'm not talking about India today, but that's how it is seen. So uh, Yudhishthira certainly has an initial hesitation, but you know, he's always trying to make peace with Duryodhana. He understands that as much as they're coexisting, uh, they don't necessarily have the peace and harmony that he expects to have. And also, you know, he says it is not right for a Kshatriya, a king, uh, to turn down an invitation from another king. So he accepts that invitation. Now, in the story of the Mahabharata, this is also a deeply allegorical moment, that moment when uh, Yudhishthira accepts that invitation for gambling, because all the reasoning and justification he gives, uh, he gives completely knowing that gambling is not a righteous act and he should not be doing it, but then he gives all this rationale, his mind comes in and explains this in all these different ways, so that he can go and gamble. Now. Uh, what this allegorically represents is what we constantly do in our own spiritual lives. We have to learn these lessons just by experience because we are constantly gambling with the material side. As much as we have the spiritual side has its territory and the material delusions are functioning on their own, the material delusions cannot take away the spiritual side or cannot uh, completely destroy them uh, uh, when you're grounded. Uh, in spirituality, in your daily practices, in your own attitude towards life and in your devotion to God, when we are grounded in these principles, these cannot be taken away from us just by brute force. So delusion has to play a more subtler game. Uh, the pull of Satan, the pull of Maya is ever so subtle because it speaks to you exactly in the ways that you can hear and you can be confused. So somehow it can start breaking that foundation of spiritual life that whole uh, like that's holding all of this together. And that's that act of gambling. Because what Yudhishthira is saying yes to is gambling all of his spiritual power and that spiritual grounding that is holding these virtues in place, that has given them everything that they have today. And he is agreeing to this game of dice without fully understanding the repercussions. He does not fully appreciate or understand that everything he owns can be taken away and will be taken away when he uh, gambles with the material side. But he's tempted. He's swayed by that pull of Maya and he agrees to this game. And I'm going to digress slightly just a bit and to uh, tell you another brief story which I think is a beautiful illustration of uh, what this principle uh, represents. Um, it's a myth mythological story to told of Narada and Vishnu uh, once when uh, Narada was walking with Vishnu, he asks uh, him the question, uh, Lord Narayana, how is it possible that 
the the name of the lord and devotion are so sweet and absolutely so satisfying that anybody would be drawn away from it that anybody would want uh, to pursue desires of this world and to be drawn away from the lord i don't even understand i don't know how it's possible i just cannot even imagine that somebody could be caught in delusion once they know how sweet the name of the lord is and how great uh, the spiritual life is and the lord says he smiles and he says narada yes you are right but you know i am very thirsty why don't you go get a glass of water for me from that town that we see there and narada walks up to this town and finds uh, somebody uh, knocks on a door to get a glass of water and as soon as somebody opens the door he sees this beautiful woman standing there he gets water and he ends up chatting with her and one thing leads to another and he falls in love and he marries her i'm going to fast forward the story and uh, and then he has children and then he now has a, a family he has a job he has a life in the small town and everything is going on well and life goes on like this for years and years for 12 years and one fine day there is this great flood that comes into the town the river overflows because of the monsoons and this deluge of water that is going coming into the town completely destroys everything it destroys all the houses it takes away his family he doesn't know where his wife and children are and all of his wealth is lost in this flood and now the once the flood has subsided he is lying without uh, anything any belongings penniless just as a naked man on this floor of sand just by the river uh, mourning uh, the death of his wife and all of his children and how he has lost everything and wondering how he is going to get everything back and at this point the lord walks up to narada and says narada what happened to the glass of water that i asked you for now that story almost seems uh, you know uh, apocryphal it's not like we are talking about a real person or a real incident but it is extremely illustrative of that power of delusion of how that single thread uh, can pull us into that force that force field of satan um, that can draw us into that world of maya and before we realize we have completely lost connection with that higher nature with god and guru that guiding force that is protecting us all the time and the act of gambling is us saying yes you know the very first impulse of being drawn to that uh, delusion when we say yes to that then uh, we can barely control what's about to follow uh, and in the same way when yudhishthira says yes to that invitation from vidura he is going to soon find out that he cannot control the eventual uh, way in which things are going to unfold and how he's going to lose everything and it is important and instructive for us in our own lives even in simple things you know how about i just go watch this movie tonight and why do i have to meditate every day you know i have meditated a lot in my own life you know everything is going well nothing nothing major is going to happen if i just watch this movie once oh what could be wrong i'm just going to have a drink with my friends it's not a big deal oh how about i just go enjoy this here or you know all of us face different delusions i'm not trying to draw objective standards of what's spiritual and what's not uh but it's important for us to know that these impulses are uh, uh seemingly harmless but in their true core they are in fact satanic uh not in the sense of b- being uh evil somehow painting this evil picture over the world that is around us or our friends or drinking or eating meat or all the temptations that surround us they are not evil in themselves but those temptations that come to us um uh, that subtle pull of maya that is telling us that this is okay or that is okay or it's not a big deal or you can do this and still be spiritual or you can compromise just a little bit on your spiritual ideals and you won't uh, you won't know nothing will happen to you you can still stay strong that impulse is so satanic that we have to constantly be paying attention to that and be watchful uh, to protect ourselves uh, from that pull of maya so we can stay grounded in our own higher nature coming back to the story uh, the the kings of Hasti, uh, indraprastha the pandava brothers arrive at the palace of hastinapura and the stage is set for this game of dice uh, what is about to unfold is rather unfortunate but things keep moving on and shakuni who represents this attachment this attachment to delusion and attachment to the material plane uh, he is extremely adept in the game of dice and that's really what uh, the satanic pull is that i was referring to because that attachment that we have to the material desires and to this material 
material plane can pull us back into this delusion with its power uh, without us realizing uh, where we are going. So he plays the game of dice. Initially, when the game starts, he allows Yudhishthira to win once or twice, giving him the confidence to bet more and more. But gradually, Yudhishthira starts losing big. He starts losing all of his wealth. He starts losing the palace. He starts losing his armies. He starts losing everything he has gained. He starts losing the control over his sub-territories. And one by one by one, uh, he almost becomes weaker and weaker as the game moves on. And everybody is assembled in this palace. Bhishma, Drona, Dhritarashtra, Vidura, all of them are watching this unfold. And Duryodhana and the Karava brothers and Karna and Shakuni are all cheering on uh, for the Pandava brothers to lose everything. Because that's the negative side, the delusory side that is constantly trying to take our spiritual life away. And the ego and the mind are spectators watching this game. They don't have the power to control it. We often think that our willpower is strong and somehow our mind can come in and save us when we need it, but it cannot because these powers are only, these, uh, these elements are simply witnesses in this game of dice. The true game is being played between our own spiritual virtues and the powers of delusion, our desires, uh, the material nature, our attachment uh, to happiness, our attachment to uh, all those things that pull us into that negative side those are the things that are playing the game of dice not the mind or the ego or dharma so the game is moving on um, eventually leading up to Yud uh, Yudhishthira losing the palace of Indraprastha Yudhishthira losing the entire kingdom of Indraprastha so the Pandava brothers are still continuing to play the game of dice uh, Shakuni is edging them on he's not letting them uh, um, go easily. He is not going to let them go at all until they are completely destroyed and every bit of what they own is taken away from them. And when nothing is left, uh, Duryodhana and Shakuni propose that even though you don't have any wealth, you can still bet on things. You can, uh, you have your brothers, and in a way, they would listen to everything you say. So they were, they are, uh, they are not your possessions per se, but however, they are un completely under your control. So why don't you bet on them? And he starts betting even on his own brothers. Uh, such is the unfortunate turn of events that happens uh, when you enter that game of dice. You start losing. Um, bit by bit, the very foundation, the very essence of our spiritual life and all the things that are positive and good eventually start fading away. And uh, it will be very long before we come back to our senses and realize what is happening. So Yudhishthira starts betting on his brother Sahadeva, starting with him, uh, Nakula, Arjuna, Bhima, all four of them are lost. Yudhishthira does not know what to do now. And Shakuni says, you can bet on yourself. Uh, you can give yourself up in this game of dice so we can completely take control over you. Uh, that is still something you own. You have lost everything. Why don't you bet on yourself? Maybe you'll win something back. Maybe you'll win Arjuna back. Maybe you'll win Bhima back. And Dhrishtra is tempted again and he bets himself. And uh, as sad as it is, he loses uh, himself. And now all the five bro Pandava brothers are enslaved by the Kauravas and Shakuni. Uh, it is really an extremely low point in the story of the Mahabharata, but it's going to get even worse. Because at this point, Shakuni says, you still have your wife Draupadi. Why don't you bet on her? How about uh, we play on Draupadi? Maybe you can win yourself back and then you can get back your footing and then you can gradually win everything back in this game of dice. And Yudhishthira falls prey to that as well and he bets on Draupadi and he loses. Now the Yudhishthiras, the Pandavas, have lost everything. They have lost their own self-will. They have lost Draupadi, the Kundalini power. They lost all of their spiritual uh, virtues. They have lost everything that they could call their own. Uh, again, allegorically, we understand what is happening here. All that has been gained through that austerity, that focus and deep concentration and all the training and discipline have been claimed by the material forces. It is not lost forever in time because time has its own ups and downs and tides. However, for right now, as uh, Yudhishthira is falling prey to the sway of that materialism, uh, he's falling prey to the temptation that Shakuni is presenting in front of him, he loses everything. All of this is lost. And at this point, 
uh, the game turns really, really sour. Uh, everybody is watching the Dhritarashtra, Bhishma and uh, Vidura, but they're not able to intrude and stop it because things have already gone completely out of hand. And Duryodhana is so powerful and forceful at this point that nobody can stand in front of him because, you know, he has the power now. He has, he has even uh, gained the crown of Indraprastha. Now all the Pandavas are his slaves. Now what can anybody tell Duryodhana? At this point, Karna proposes that uh, Draupadi be brought to the arena because she is in fact a slave. She is not a self-willed person after all. And they start making extremely derogatory remarks that Draupadi is not a chaste woman because she is married to five men. Yes, in fact, she is married to five men, uh, literally speaking. But uh, their marriage is of a different nature. Uh, even though she has five husbands, um, she only uh, is married to one husband for a period of one year. Uh, and then um, she moves on to another uh, husband for the next year so there he she is almost time shared between them uh, in order to establish a righteous scheme of how to stay married in that kind of a relationship again as we saw the story is allegorical and uh, this is simply a literal explanation of how the uh, story is depicted in the epic so uh, uh, Karna makes this comment that she be brought into the stage and uh, presented in front of her new owners, uh, which is Duryodhana and Shakuni and all the Kaurava brothers. So uh, Duryodhana orders his brother Dushasana to grab Draupadi and bring it, bring her uh, to this arena. Now, as we know, Dushasana represents anger. Duryodhana represents material desires. So whenever material desires are thwarted, the next thing that immediately comes into play is anger. Uh, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains all this really beautifully. But we are also seeing that played out in the story right now. So the Shasana goes to the quarters of Draupadi and he uh, drags her uh, into the palace, uh, into the stage where this game of dice is happening. Like I said, this is one of the absolute low points of uh, the story of the Mahabharata, almost so saddening that you cannot bear to watch it if it's uh, being played out in front of your eyes. Uh, I have to end the story here because what happens after this is also sad, but all of this does have a happy, happy ending at the end. So we'll come back next week and see what happens next. God bless you all.